Over the years, car makers have strived to make their cars more and more economical. Now, I have to acknowledge that on the basis of surveys that we've done on here and comments on various videos that I've done, a lot of our viewers want to hang on to their older cars. The reasons are many and varied. We've discussed them at length in other videos. But the question that we're going to look at in this video is, can you modify an older car to make it more economical or more efficient. And we're going to look at some of the strategies manufacturers have done over the years to strive for this perfect fuel economy and see if some of these can be retrofitted to our older engines. We're talking about fuel efficiency on our cars. We need to make sure that there's a decent baseline. We need to make sure we're on top of the maintenance and the car is running in good order. If the engine is not efficient, if it's coked up with lots of carbon or we've been using the wrong oil for many years, we're going to have problems. We're not even going to get to the manufacturer's stated fuel economy figures, let alone improving that. Anything we do really is going to start off on the back foot. It's not going to be as effective as it would be if the engine was running efficiently. In that case then we want to make sure that the engine is perfect baseline to start modifying and upgrading. We need to check that everything is working, make sure there's no error codes, that the injectors are clean, that's probably one of the most critical things we can do, and make sure that we're using the correct oil. Now this may not be the oil that was specified when our car was made 15-20 years ago. Oil formulations have moved on considerably since then. And it may be that a newer spec that the manufacturer is using will be more effective on our older engine or our engine that has a higher mileage. We won't go into specific detailed oil choices in this video because it is a very complex subject. It varies very much depending on the type of engine you've got and a number of other factors. Running good quality fuel and injector cleaner also help us to get to that baseline. Do a few runs, just check how much fuel economy you're getting on the tank and hopefully you'll be in the baseline of manufacturers. Bear in mind that manufacturers have always been very generous in the fuel economy figures that they're quoting when cars are new and it's very hard to achieve that. That really is the best that you could ever hope to get for in perfect lab conditions. But just make sure that you're somewhere in the ballpark with an economical driving style. And if you're not, investigate why that's the case and fix any of those problems before you even start looking at modifications and upgrades. The tire pressures are also critical. We've noted that having slightly higher tire pressures than lower, manufacturers often recommend a minimum and a maximum. Being toward the maximum generally gives you better fuel economy. The tire tends to be more of a dome shape at those higher pressures with no weight in the car. So you're getting less grip. We're going to talk about tire choices later in this video. We're just really talking about making sensible changes to tire pressure, not going to the extremes, not changing the structure and dimensions of the tire by forcing too much air in there, but just making sure that we're not at the other end where there's too little pressure and the tire is creating a lot more heat and extra drag as we're trying to use it. So a significant thing that we can do is changing the tires that we have. Now, manufacturers have come out with eco tires. They have a lower rolling resistance that generally equates to slightly less grip. But in the real world, you probably won't notice it. How effective are these energy efficient tires and how much fuel saving will you actually expect? Well, I've had them on my cars in the past. It was Michelin Energy that I specifically used and it was an Audi A3 turbo diesel. And while they were on the car, I got three to 4% more fuel economy. That's measuring it over a year. Hopefully that ironed out any of the averages and extremes of short-term driving durations. And when I switched back to a non-energy tire, the fuel economy went back down to where it was originally. So I'm fairly certain of my figures there. It will vary according to your car, but tire dimensions also matter. If you want an economical car, you want the tire dimensions to be as narrow as possible. You want as little resistance on the road. Now that goes completely against having lots of grip and being able to get the power down. You can see then that there is a, a fine line that we need to tread between having excessive drag and grip on our tyres and optimum fuel economy. But I have known some hypermilers fit different alloy rims that are narrower to allow them to fit narrower tyres. And often manufacturers have a range of tyre widths that they fit to a model. There's often an economical base model and a high performance model. And there can be a significant difference between the wheel dimensions fitted to both of those. Also fitting smaller 
alloy wheels will reduce the weight. And when we can save weight, that also manages to save fuel. And we're talking about unsprung weight on the suspension. So if we had a set of 19s on a car, we went down to 17s, we would notice a reasonable amount of fuel saving just because of the lack of weight and the profile of the tyre will also obviously be different which will have a knock-on effect to the rolling resistance and give us a little bit more of a fuel economy benefit. Every 10% reduction in weight we achieve will save somewhere between 6 and 8% of the fuel that we use and it's surprising how much weight is stored up in those alloy wheels so that is probably one of the easiest simplest upgrades just changing the alloy rim size. Aerodynamic pressure on the car or drag it increases with the square of speed at 60 miles an hour for example 50 percent of the engine power is fighting this aerodynamic drag so we want to reduce aerodynamic drag first up we need to take off the silly stuff that we've got on a car we've got one of those roof boxes have we even got bars on the roof all of these things go a significant way to adding to that aerodynamic drag reducing that will straight away have a benefit on our fuel economy we could also look at vortex generators they're the little diamond shapes that you have have on the trailing edge of the back of the car. They help to keep the air attachment to the car and they can reduce drag. Also spoilers, not wings, spoilers will reduce the overall drag on the back of the car, just spoiling that airflow as it comes over, helping it to join up smoothly further behind the car. Wings obviously will add downforce and significant extra drag. So if we added a wing to the car, that would cause problems. Well, I've done videos discussing the difference between spoilers and wings. If no one's ever explained to you that the significant difference and how they actually work, it'd be an interesting video to just watch to increase your general knowledge in that area. Think about reducing load on the engine. The accessories that we run, the air conditioner, the radio, we've got thousand watt speakers in the car. That's going to have an effect on the fuel economy. Just minimizing the electrical load means the car has to do less work to keep the alternator rotating to keep enough charge going into the battery. We can also get low drag alternators that are more efficient at converting that kinetic energy into power. We can get electric water pumps, electric oil pumps, and they're often associated with a dry sump setup. These actually allow the car to regulate the flow of coolant and oil according to the conditions. So so it's not running at a set RPM and that reduces the overall drag on the engine. The mechanical variants of these devices are powered by the crank as it rotates so they're creating extra drag on the engine. Minimizing that will generally improve fuel economy a little. The car's computer, the ECU, whatever manufacturers call it, there's lots of different names for it, but we're talking about the thing that manages everything inside the engine electronically. If you get that specially tuned or mapped, as we would say here in the UK, you can dramatically alter the efficiency of the engine. In fact, if you have a turbo diesel engine, it's not unknown to see an extra 30% of fuel economy just by having it mapped. You can actually ask for a specific fuel economy map that is optimizing the fuel that goes into the engine to make sure you get a decent amount of power but also efficiently extracting that power so you're maximizing every drop of fuel that goes into the engine. On petrol or gasoline counterparts the fuel economy saving is generally lower but you can probably get 15 to 20 percent more fuel economy if you have a specific fuel map on the engine's computer. Mechanical modifications get rather expensive. As soon as you start taking the engine apart, the cost goes up exponentially, especially if we're not doing this work ourselves. Porting, which is where the channels that go into the engine through the head are optimized to maximize the airflow. That's something manufacturers have done on modern engines. If you compare the head on a modern engine with that on an engine that was built 15, 30 years ago, you'll see a significant difference in the way it's machined, it's produced, it's much smoother. The channels are much better designed to aid that airflow into the engine, which is more critical in our modern, more efficient engines. The camshaft profile, most cars have a variable cam control system. Manufacturers have got various different implementations of this, but if we've got an older engine without that, we might want to look at changing the profile of the cam, which alters the opening and closing of the valve which can dramatically affect the amount of fuel and the overall efficiency of the engine. But again, we're talking about very expensive modifications for a relatively small difference in fuel economy. Making sure we're using the right fuel. If the engine's been set up for high octane or high cetane fuel, 
we need to be using it. It's not going to be working very efficiently if it's struggling with the fuel. It's trying to resist knock and detonation and it's not getting that efficient clean burn. And that's on us really. If you have an engine that is designed for these fuels and you don't use it, you're going to be struggling to get fuel to convert into energy and you'll be down on power, potentially causing damage to the engine as well. Increasing the compression ratio of the engine generally increases the thermal efficiency. And we've seen manufacturers doing this. They've moved beyond port injection to direct injection, which allows much higher cylinder pressures. And that has really boosted fuel economy, especially when mated with a turbocharger and the fuel goes in at the very last minute. But on an older engine that doesn't have direct injection, just increasing the compression may go some way to improving the fuel economy and the efficiency of the engine but that may force us to use a higher octane fuel to resist knock which is always a risk when we go with higher compression on these port injection engines. Manufacturers have really got a whole arsenal of electronic devices and gadgets and gizmos that they've used to improve the efficiency of the engine. We've mentioned the variable valve timing which changes effectively the cam profile. Honda had a VTEC system many years ago. Most manufacturers have some kind of adjustment that happens happens to allow the valves to open and close depending on what the engine is doing or what the driver expects of it to just maximize the fuel efficiency. If we have an older engine it may be the case that we can swap a modern head. We see this a lot on the older Civics where the non-VTEC heads were swapped out for VTEC heads. Obviously there's other adjustments that need to be made but in some cases that's a fairly simple upgrade to get much more fuel efficiency and even more power out of the engine. Manufacturers have also moved on to cylinder de activation where two cylinders are closed, allowing the throttle to be fully open at half power effectively rather than being open a little bit causing extra turbulence which dramatically increases the efficiency of the engine. My car 1.4 TFSI has cylinder on demand and when it kicks in it generally means that the fuel economy jumps from about 40 miles to the gallon to about 80 miles to the gallon even more in some situations so it does dramatically increase the fuel economy. It's not that easy to retrofit to older engines but if we have it it's worth noting how it works where the threshold is for it to cut in. And just driving to make sure that we're on that threshold where it cuts in can go a long way to improving our overall fuel economy. That might just mean dropping down a gear and hanging on to slightly higher RPM than we're used to, just to keep us in that zone where the cylinder on demand is effectively working. A rather complex upgrade is water injection, where water is injected into the engine. This can reduce detonation. It can have a similar effect to using higher octane fuel and effectively allow the engine to extract more power. It is complicated to set up. Some cars have kits available where all the calculations have been done. You literally just bolt the thing on and let it run. But you've then got a water reservoir to keep topping up and make sure that that is sufficiently supplied with water. You don't want that running dry while you're driving. Now, I will mention fuel additives and injector cleaners. These don't increase fuel economy. They restore lost fuel economy. They work by cleaning the injectors, cleaning off some of the carbon deposits from inside the engine. If you've got direct injection, they're not going to clean the intake, obviously, because they won't ever touch the intake. But they can help to keep the engine burning cleanly. And if we have got an older direct injection engine and there is significant carbon buildup, we really want to get that carbon cleaned off. So a walnut blast or some other cleaning method, a professional cleaning method, will go a long way to restoring the lost power and getting back the fuel economy that we expect from the engine that we have. So overall, if we did all of these modifications on an older engine, we might be looking at a 20% fuel economy gain. If we did them on a newer engine, the manufacturers have already gone a long way to maximizing the fuel economy. And any benefits we get will probably be in the order of 5% maximum. It varies dramatically depending on the type of engine we have. There's a big difference between turbo diesel engines and naturally aspirated gas gasoline or petrol powered cars. Also, when you add a turbocharger to these naturally aspirated cars, that also dramatically affects things as well. Have you done any modifications solely to increase fuel economy on your car? If you have, please let us know in the comments. I love hearing from you and you've probably thought of some other methods that I haven't mentioned in this video. I haven't mentioned fuel magnets and I haven't mentioned HHO, hydrogen from water. There's been quite a few videos and quite a few phases over the years where people have employed these methods. I am not sold on either of those. I don't feel that they add significantly to the fuel economy that you get from your car. But if you've got a little secret, please let me know in the comments. 
Thanks for watching the video. Please boot that like button if you found it useful. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so because that really helps us to get out there. And I've lined up this video and this playlist that you should find really interesting. Thanks for watching. See you in these next videos.